Well, this is live. Not live TV, but live at Ramakrishna Monastery. <clears throat> Om. Chant the name of the Lord and his glory unceasingly, that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quenched that mighty forest fire, worldly lust, raging furiously within. O name, stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart, opening cup to knowledge of thyself. O self, round deep in the waves of his bliss, chanting his name continually, Tasting his nectar at every step, bathing in his name, that bath for weary souls. Various are thy names, O Lord. In each and every name, thy power resides. No times are set, no rites are needful. For chanting of thy name, so vast is thy mercy. How huge then is my wretchedness, who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name. O oh, my mind, be humbler than the blade of grass, be patient and forbearing like the tree, take no honor to thyself, give honor to all, chant unceasingly the name of the Lord. O oh, Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or retinue, the playthings of lust or the toys of fame, as many times as I may be reborn, grant me, O Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy, consider him as dust beneath thy feet. Ah, how I long for the day when an instant separation from thee, O Govinda, will be as a thousand years when my heart burns away with its desire, and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet, let me be, in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou, who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. <clears throat> Om Bhadram Karne Vishrunu Yama Devaha Bhadram Pashye Maksha Bhirya Chatraha Terai rangai istushtu vagum sasta nubihi vyashe madevahi tanyadayu Om shanti 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 Om, O oh gods, may we hear with our ears what is auspicious. O oh, ye adorable ones, may we see with our eyes what is auspicious. May we sing praises to ye and enjoy with strong limbs and body the life allotted to us by the gods. Om, peace, peace, peace. Blessed are those who sacrifice their lives for God and his children. Blessed are those who sacrifice their lives for God and his children. 
Give thy life and give thy love. Give all, give all. When thy hands and heart are free, when thy hands and heart are free, thou shalt receive him who is all, all in all. There is a lesson. We do our best part when we leave behind the element of lower self. It is not that we lack the power of love. We lack its application. We fail to find an avenue through which to express it. More we establish love in our heart and abide by it. The more we establish love in our heart and abide by it, the more the vista of our unuse, useless, useless usefulness expands. The more we establish love in our heart and abide by it, the more the vista of our usefulness expand. The more the vista of our usefulness expands, the more we establish love in our heart. We never do anything noble without love. We must sever. We must sever ourselves from selfish interest and fix our thought on loving, self-forgetting service. We fail to find an avenue through which to express it. The more we establish love in our heart and abide by it, the more the vista of our usefulness expands. We never do anything novel without love. We must sever ourselves from selfish interest and fix our thought on loving, self-forgetting service. Let us pray. O oh, infinite and all-loving Lord, I lay my heart at your feet. May it be cleansed of all stain of selfishness. May it radiate a love that knows no hate. May it find all its joy in willing service to you and your children. Amen. This was a surprise to me this morning. This is actually the thought of the day by Swami Paramananda. Today's thought. And this is exactly today's topic. I was gladly surprised when I read this message and this thought this morning. I was like, I have to share it with all of you. This is the great paradox. This is the great paradox of charity. That unless we are selfish enough to desire to become perfectly unselfish, we have not charity. And unless we love ourselves enough to seek perfect happiness in the total forgetfulness of ourselves, we will never find happiness. Charity is a self-interest which seeks fulfillment in the renunciation of all its interests. There is a paradox, says Thomas Merton. And this is the great paradox of charity that unless we are selfish enough to desire to become perfectly unselfish, we have not charity. 
And unless we love ourselves enough to seek perfect happiness in the total forgetfulness of ourselves, we will never find charity. We will never find happiness. Because charity is a self-interest. Charity is a self-interest which seeks fulfillment in the renunciation of all its interest. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us from home. It is indeed about all of us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about all of us. In today's talk, I will be analyzing something that is essential for us to be aware of in our daily life something that I find extremely important. And unless we are honest enough with ourselves, we cannot really grow in our spiritual life. Our human, heathen motives, our innate instincts, I don't know if you remember sometime in November, I talked about the name of the talk was No Ego, No Problem. And yes, of course, I talked about ego and our ego, our basic identity born of ignorance and of who we truly are. Our basic identity born of ignorance of who we truly are. Who are we truly? Spiritual beings. Says Thomas Merton, every one of us is shadowed by an illusory person. Every one of us is shadowed by a false self. My false and private self is the one who wants to exist outside the reach of God's will and God's love, outside the reality, outside of reality and outside of life. Therefore, there is only one problem on which all my existence, my peace and my happiness depend, to discover myself in discovering God. If I find him, I will find myself. And if I find my true self, my true being, I will find him. We need to find our true being. Ultimately, says Thomas Merton, the only way that I can be myself is to become identified with him in whom is hidden the reason and fulfillment of my existence. Let me remind you, we human beings are naturally selfish. We human beings are naturally self-centered. We human beings are naturally egotistic. In Vedanta, we declare that human beings, except, of course, for the liberated souls who have become identified with him, are naturally selfish. We all, car we all carry a higher or lower degree of selfishness as an instinctive feature, instinctive feature of our personality. It is so subtle that sometimes we are not even aware of our instinctive, instinctive hidden motives behind our actions. Speaking about renunciation in regards to the sannyasins, Swami Vivekananda once said, 
Remember, renunciation consists in the total absence of all selfish motives and not in mere abstinence from external contact. Renunciation consists in the total absence of all selfish motives and not in the mere abstinence from external contact, such as avoiding to touch one's money kept with another at the same time enjoying all its benefits. Can you keep this money for me? Have you ever heard about the elephant in the room? Have you ever heard about that expression? Do you know what it means? An elephant in the room is an important issue that people are reluctant to acknowledge or address. It has become a social taboo. Now I ask you, what about our inner elephant? What about the huge elephant within all of us? What about that taboo that nobody wants to talk about? I found this very interesting. In a research by Kevin Simler, who is a software engineer, and Robin Hansen, an economist professor at George Manson University. They call these, very interestingly, the elephant in the brain the elephant in the brain, an important but unacknowledged feature of how our minds work. Important but unacknowledged. We don't want to know of how our minds work. It is, therefore, an introspective taboo. We are social creatures to the inmost center of our being. Humans are primates, specifically apes. Human nature is therefore a modified form of ape nature. We are, as it were, an evolution of primates. And if we analyze their behavior, we shouldn't be surprised about our similarities. There is a difference, though. We human beings, even though we sometimes behave in a Machiavellian way with hidden intentions, trying to dominate with our political, political maneuverings, the way we show off our fitness, again, with hidden intentions, we mostly portray our motives as cooperative and pro-social. Is it clear? We human beings are a species that's not only capable of acting on hidden motives, we are designed to do it. Our self-interest. We all, we all act on our self-interest and our brain at the same time is trying hard to manipulate and process our selfish motives so that we do not appear selfish in front of other people. Our brains are as a safe, safety mechanism often keep us, our conscious mind, in the dark. The less we know of our own ugly motives, the easier it is the easier it is 
to hide them from others. The worst thing is that we seem to be all right with that. We don't really want to pay too much attention to it. But in a spiritual life, we must. There is some kind of self-deception going on and seems to be strategic. And naturally, very few people are comfortable talking about this. Microsociology is one of the main levels of analysis of sociology concerning the nature of everyday human social interactions and agency on a small scale, let's say face to face. Let's analyze an example of its opposite, microsociology. Hmm? To see the difference clearly with this microsociology. In microsociology, in macrosociology, excuse me, we analyze the study, we analyze the study of habits of college students who play video games. In microsociology, on the other hand, we will be examining the way college students the way college students in a particular dorm interact with each other when playing video games. A smaller scale. When we study how people interact with each other on a small scale, in real time, face to face, we quickly learn to appreciate the depth and complexity of our social behaviors and how little we are consciously aware of what's going on. These behaviors include, or these behaviors include laughter, blushing, tears, eye contact, and body language. In fact, we have such little introspective access into these behaviors or volunt voluntary control over them that it's fair to say we aren't really in charge. Our brains choreograph these interactions on our behalf and with surprising skills. Is it clear? I think you all know what I'm talking about we are discussing today. While we anguish over what to say next, our brains manage to laugh at just the right moments, flash the right facial expression, hold or break eye contact as appropriate, negotiate territory and social status with our posture, and interpret and react to all these behaviors in our interaction with people. Humans are strategically blind to body language because it often betrays our ugly, selfish, competitive motives. To acknowledge the signals sent by our bodies feels dangerous to some people as if we were admitting that we are ruled by some base animal nature. I hope I'm not making you feel uncomfortable. But sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zone in order to learn more about ourselves. We are unconsciously being deceived, and we seem to be okay with that, by our brains to look good while behaving badly. It's not only by confronting this elephant in our brain that we can begin to understand a little bit more about ourselves. 
It is truly by confronting and being aware of the elephant that we can make progress in our spiritual life. It's not that we are completely unaware of our distasteful motives. Many of them are readily apparent to us. We just need to choose to look at them. Why can't, be, why can't we be honest with ourselves? The answer is that our thoughts aren't as private as we imagine. In many ways, conscious thought is a rehearsal of what we are ready to say to others. The elephant in the brain is, my dears, in one word, our selfishness. The selfish parts of our psyche, our unconscious mechanism we employ to survive. Self-deception is simply part of human nature, a fact that makes perfect sense in light of the competitive selfish logic of evolution. Deception allows us to reap certain benefits without paying the full costs. Yes, the fact that we are competitive social animals fighting for power fighting for status and pleasures, the fact that we are sometimes willing to lie and cheat to get ahead, the fact that we hide some of our motives and that we do so in order to mislead others. We should often blush at our noblest deeds if the world were to see all their underlying motives, our hidden motives. These are all hidden taboos. Sigmund Freud was one important champion in, a study, in a studying these hidden motives. He described many of them along with various mechanisms for keeping them unconscious. repressed thoughts, and conflict within the psyche. Our brains are experts at flirting, negotiating social status, and playing social politics, while we, the self-conscious parts of our brains, manage to keep our thoughts pure and chaste. We must admit there is a risk to confronting our hidden motives. Human beings are self-deceived because self-deception works. Self-deception is useful. It allows us, it allows us to reap the benefits of selfish behavior while posing as unselfish in front of others it helps us look better than what we really are. Confronting our delusions must therefore, at least in part, undermine their very reason for existing. There is a very real sense in which we might be better off not knowing what we are up to. We don't always know what our brains are up to, but we often pretend to know, and therein lies the trouble. Let me give you some examples so that it doesn't seem too vague. Picture two male 
picture in your mind two male chimpanzees engaged in an act of social grooming. Most other primates have thick fur all over their bodies. When left unchecked, this fur quickly becomes matted with dirt and debris. It also makes an attractive home for fleas, lice, ticks, and other parasites. As a result, primate fur needs periodic grooming to stay clean. Individual primates can and do groom themselves, but they can only effectively groom about half of their bodies. They cannot easily groom their own backs, faces, and heads. So to keep their entire body clean, to keep their entire bodies clean, they need a little help from their friends. If we could somehow ask the grooming chimp, what is he, what is he doing? He might give a pragmatic explanation. I am trying to remove these bits and pieces from my friend's back. That's the pur purpose of the activity and what his attention is focused on. If I groom my friend's back, he's more likely to groom mine in return. In grooming, where if grooming were strictly a hygienic activity, we would expect larger species, those with more fur, to spend more time grooming each other. But in fact, there is no correlation. We might, we might ask ourselves, what's going on here? There must be some other function to play or at play. Robin Dun Dunbar, Robin Dunbar, A primatologist says social grooming isn't just about hygiene. Guess what? Social grooming is about politics. By grooming each other, primates help forge alliances that help them in other situations. The groomer says, I am willing to use my spare time to help you, while the groomee says, I am comfortable enough to let you approach from me, to let you approach me from behind or touch my face. Meanwhile, both parties strengthen their alliance merely by spending pleasant time in close proximity. Two rivals, however, would find it hard to let their guards down to enjoy such a relaxed activity. Bottom line is, grooming, says Dunbar, creates a platform of which trust can be built. For example, it explains why higher rank individuals receive some more grooming than lower rank individuals. When low-ranking primates choose to groom one of their superiors, they are less likely to be groomed in return. So they must be angling for some other kind of benefit rather than simple reciprocity. Indeed, grooming partners are more likely to share food, tolerate each other and feeding on feeding sites, and support each other during confrontations with other members of the group. Let us know that these primates don't need to be conscious of their political motivations. They don't. Primates are thereby endowed with instincts that make them feel good when they groom each other without necessarily understanding why they feel good. Now, it would be a mistake to call this 
animal motives hidden is good, at least in the psychological sense. When baboons groom each other, they may happen not to be thinking about the political consequences, but perhaps they are simply acting on instinct. But their lack of awareness isn't strategic. They have no need to conceal the political intentions underlying their grooming behavior and thus no need to suppress their own knowledge. Knowledge suppression is useful only when two conditions are met. When others have partial visibility into your mind and when they are judging you and meeting out rewards or punishments based on what they see in your mind. That's when you want to suppress knowledge. Human social behavior is complex and often inscrutable. There is something called the Machiavellian, Machiavell, Machiavellian intelligent hypothesis, or hypothesis, excuse me. This hypothesis is the idea that our ancestors, our ancestors go, got smarter. The idea that our ancestors got smarter. Primarily in order to compete against each other in a variety of social and political scenarios. Now, we have given enough thought to our body instinct nature. And we have analyzed a lot of our darkest side. Let's try to regain altitude. Let's try to regain altitude back again. In Vedanta, we talk about the achievement of freedom. You all know we all want to be free. We call that in Sanskrit moksha, the mastery over the inner and external nature, the realization of God in religious language, if you may. Would it be selfish to pursue our own freedom? Can we lead a spiritual life knowing that in reality, hidden within, we are looking for our own salvation. Would that be selfish? Vivekananda says, we attend lectures and read books, argue and reason about God and soul, religion and salvation. These are not spirituality because spirituality does not exist in books or theories or in philosophies. It is not in learning or reasoning, but in actual inner growth. Unfurled, he says, the banner of love. Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. Arise, arise once more, for nothing can be done without renunciation. Renunciation of what? I'm not talking to those who are sannyasins. Everybody, we need to be aware and be absolutely committed to our spiritual life. And the only way to do it is to be sincere with ourselves 
and to confront that elephant within us. That elephant is our selfish motives. According to our scriptures, every living being and every human being is bound by I, is bound by mind, mind, I and mind, likes and dislikes. We human beings are bound by this package. I, it's called ahamkara. Mine is mamakara, mama. Raga likes and duesha dislikes. Because of these four, we are naturally selfish. As long as this selfishness exists, all human pursuits are conditioned, determined, governed by this selfishness. All the human activities, all our goals are stained, as it were, by our selfishness, our selfish motives. Selfishness is, is instinctive and universal for all human beings. We can't blame anybody. We have to accept it. There is nothing to do. We are naturally wired to be selfish, whether we want to be aware of it or not. If our scriptures say that if all pursuits are selfish, we admit that our freedom pursuit is also a selfish motive too. But our scriptures, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, we all, they all talk about this. They claim, they say, that it's the most intelligent, selfish pursuit. Remember what I shared with you at the beginning, Thomas Merton, about charity. It's the most intelligent, selfish pursuit. Because one who pursues this goal of life, this freedom we call moksha, is most, has an understanding, excuse me, has an understanding about selfishness. That's the reason why I share with you the elephant in the brain. We need to understand and accept our nature so that we can go around it and go beyond it. As long as life As long as I live a life-centered activity in my own selfish self, small self, I am bound to be miserable. So what is that we need to understand about our selfishness? That I, mine, I like it, I dislike it. What is that we need to understand and accept? First of all, our relationship with our body. We need to reformulate our relationship with our own body since we are so identified with it. We practically call it I. Vedanta teaches us but our body, mind, mind is not me. Mano buddhya hankara, chittani naham, 
I am neither this mind. I am neither manas, buddhi, ahamkara, ego. These are means, instrument to experience this life in this world. But I am not that. It's part of our vehicle that helps us interact with each other. This body. You can also say like a, like a pair of glasses that we wear that help us interact and see. I am not this body. Dehinos min yata dehe kaumaram yo vananjaraha tata dehantara prapti dhiras tatrana muhyati. As our childhood, youth, and old age in this body to the embodied soul, so also is the attaining of another body. As his childhood, youth, and old age in this body to the embodied soul, so also is the attaining of another body, calm souls, those who have become calm by self-realization are not deluded. According to this, the continuity of the ego is no more interrupted by death than by the passing of childhood, childhood into youth and youth into old age in this body. What is another thing that I need to understand? Since I am not this body, I am neither the owner nor the controller of this body. I picked it up. I borrowed it. Like you pick up a car hmm, available according to your own karma. This body, you can say in religious language, was given to us by God. And he will take it away without notice. He will knock at the door and tell you, game over. Give me your body. We have to leave our rental somewhere. The moment we start reasoning in this way, our I sense becomes weaker. But then, who am I? Vedanta says, I am the self, the consciousness principle, who is experiencing, who is the experience of this body. I am the Atman. I am not the body. There is here a new definition of myself. I am the Atman. Consciousness. Awareness. And of the nature of bliss. I am not this body. I am not this Ahamkara. Born in this body. Hamkara, I, the sense of I, ego. And since we do not own this body, we cannot really claim ownership. It's not yours. Hmm? What is our real nature again? It's very difficult to accept, but ultimately, the goal of life is to redefine our identity with the whole. I am the Atman, the only source of bliss. 
What is another thing that we need to understand? If the source of bliss is within us, then by understanding this, I develop detachment, trying to find happiness in the outside world. We have attached, we have attachment to the objects, we have attachment to people in the world. I mistakenly, mistakenly think they are the source of happiness. The only source of happiness is the realization. The only source of happiness is the understanding and acceptance that I am that divine being, divine self, not centered in this body, but everywhere. And our life is the attempt to figure out how to identify ourselves with the whole. At least we should have that commitment. Whenever the world seems to give you happiness, know that it is only our likes and dislikes that are being pleased These two create a particular state of mind. It is our own Atma Ananda that provides bliss and we attribute it to external objects of the world. The true mental state of bliss, we find it in contentment, contentment, a steady contentment, when we tap into our inner self. By embracing our true identity, we can achieve a state of mind that experiences contentment, that experiences contentment all the time. We have to discover that bliss within us. I am the only source of happiness. Nothing from the outside can give me that permanently. Again, what do we need to understand about this elephant? My relationship with the body. I am not this body. I am not this mind. I am not this ego. I do not own this body. I can control the expiration date. My nature is the source and the only source of bliss. And at last, we need to understand the nature of the world. I hope most of you Vedantic students, you remember the story of the ghost. Hmm? There was a, a man who wanted a ghost to work for him. Hmm? But who, when he had the ghost, could not, keep him, could not keep him employed or busy enough until, until he gave him a curly tail hmm, to straighten. So, my brothers, we are trying to straighten out, to straighten out the tail of the dog, says Swami Vivekananda. These hundred thousands of years. So, my brothers, we are trying to straighten out the tail of the dog. These hundred and thousands of years, it is like a rheumatism. You drive it out from the feet. It goes to the head, you drive it from the head, it goes somewhere else. The world is a continuous state of flux. 
where change is constant. That is what we need to understand. There is nothing permanent here. We have to learn to adjust to the different conditions of the world. By hating or resisting, you cannot change it. We need to learn to accept the nature of the world as it is. What do we need to accept? These bodies as being part of this world? That we humans are selfish by nature. A wise person who has destroyed selfishness, who has accomplished self-knowledge by understanding and accepting his real I by mastering his ego, ahamkara, and the notion of mine, mamakara, can only accommodate and accept this selfishness in ignorant people. He can only navigate and accept it. What happens to us, we react. We know like, oh, that there, your selfish motive. Hmm, cheated. He understands that people are selfish and they can't do much about it unless they are determined to work on it. Unless they are the determined to see deep within themselves and bring into the surface all selfish motives. And that's our job. I know it hurts. I know it makes us feel uncomfortable. But Sri Ramakrishna pointed this out. Sri Ramakrishna, the example of renunciation, the master, the perfect sannyasi, he knew this very well. This elephant in the brain, this selfishness and hidden motives, does not surprise a wise man. I'm coming to an end, but I still need to share some more wisdom with you. I'm going to skip the, all these verses. These are all in our scriptures. I don't have time to quote them, but they are all in the Bhagavad Gita mostly. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever are the characteristics of the man of realization are themselves presented as the disciplines for an aspirant because these characteristics are the result of effort. Hmm? Adhuashta sarvabhutanam maitrah karuna evacha nirmamo nirahankaraha samadukha sukhakshami santushta satatan yogi yatat madrura nishchayaha mayarpita mano buddhi yo mat bhakta same priyaha this is what chapter? He who hates no creature and is friendly and compassionate towards all. He who is free from the feelings of I and mine, even minded in pain and pleasure, forbearing, ever content, steady in meditation, self controlled, and possessed of firm conviction with mind and intellect fixed on me, says Krishna. He who is thus devoted to me is very dear to me. <clears throat> These are characteristics 
And those are the results of effort. Those are the results of effort. Those that are the those that are the disciplines required requiring effort. Those are the disciplines requiring effort. They become the characteristics of the man of realization. Sanyamyendriya kramam sarvatra samabuddhaya te prapnuvanti mameva sarvabhuta hiterata. By fully controlling the organs, all the organs, and always being even minded, they engage, these people, they engage in the welfare of all beings. Listen to this. They engage in the welfare of all beings. And they attain me alone, says the Lord. So is freedom, moksha, a selfish motive? Provided you are not looking for your own happiness, it's not. Provided you are not self-centered and careless about everything, it's not. In the Rig Veda, we find the following line, Atmano Mokshartam, Atmano Mokshartam, Chagat Hitaya Cha. You remember that line? For the salvation of our individual self, and for the welfare, and for the well-being of all the, everybody on earth, of the world for the salvation of our individual self, lower self, and for the well-being of all. This became the model of the Ramakrishna mission, started by Swami Vivekananda, founded in 1897. Speaking of him, he says, our duty to others means helping others, doing good to the world, why we should do good to the world? Apparently to help the world, but really to help ourselves. We should always try to help the world. That should be the highest motive in all of us. We must do good. The desire to do good is the highest motive power we have. If we know all the time that it is a privilege to help others. It is a great privilege for all of us to be allowed to do anything for the world. In helping the world, we really help ourselves. In his lecture, The Religion of Buddha, he says, and I like this because clearly you can see the, the, the essence. Buddha found in India too much talking about God and his essence and too little work. He always insisted upon this fundamental truth that we are to be pure and holy and that we are to help others to be holy also. He believed that man must go to work and help others, find his soul in others, find his life in others. He believed that in the conjunction of doing good to others is the only, is the only good we do to ourselves. Looks like our life is not about us individually. Life is not about you. It's about what you do for others. 
the faster we are able to get over ourselves, the more we can do for the people who matter most. Yet nature, external forces keep pulling us down towards self-centered activities. The external world is constantly inviting consumption, either services or products, all in search of happiness. True, we are all chasing our own happiness in everyday life, trying to please our likes and dislikes. But the truth is that we will start experiencing true happiness when we start forgetting ourselves and chase everybody's happiness. The key is the collective well-being, helping others to improve in their lives and wake up to their own divinity by just being, why not, just naturally nice to each other. In helping improve somebody else's well-being, we help our own. So much he says, this rascal ego must be obliterated. Power to help mankind is with the silent ones who only live and love and withdraw their own personality entirely. They never say me or mine. They are only blessed in being the instruments to help others. Liberation and freedom are high standards, my friends. And as long as we have not fully accepted and mastered ourselves, maybe we need to start helping each other. Maybe we need to build our lives around helping people because in helping them, we help ourselves. Making sure that most of our daily efforts are aimed at contributing at another person's life. We should ask ourselves, what can I do today for another person? This is a good reminder to focus, to focus on what's larger than, than our lower self. Bartha Hari says in his 100 verses on renunciation, the root, of, the root of health has always run about it, the thousand worms in the form of dangers and disease. The root of health has always run about it, a thousand worms in the form of danger and disease. Where fortune falls, open a hundred gates of danger. Whoever is born, him, death will surely swallow. Say, where is that providence who ever created Anything that died not, where is that providence? Our life has an unknown expiration date. Our efforts and contributions to others do not. Maybe we should focus more on the path of Dharma and not doing so much chat, chat, chat. Maybe we should do something about it. The righteous path means the pleasure and joy, the well-being that I get when I contribute to others. By doing good or noble actions through one's effort, whatever satisfaction or self-respect I get, should help me expand and connect with my higher self. Time, energy, and resources you invest in people you care for and the community 
keep growing forever. We need to focus on something larger than our lower selves. The brilliance of the human species lies in our ability to put collective interest ahead of our own. We have the opportunity every day to contribute to collective efforts to others' lives. These contributions will live on well beyond our brief lifespan here on Earth. Life is about what you put back into the world, not what you take out of it. And this is supported by the Gita and the Upanishads. Life is about what you put back into the world, not what you take out of it. Life is to be lived and appreciated as it is but seen by seeing the beauty at every moment. When you consider how short life can be, you create more meaning in the world. Real growth is the product of following your contribution, your contributions more than your selfish passions. Simply asking, what can I contribute today? Leads to a better path, the path of Dharma. Now, let me share this with you. I'm aware of at the time. Scient scientists have determined human beings are innately other directed, which they refer to as being pro social. According to top researchers on this subject, the defining features of a meaningful life are connecting and contributing to something beyond yourself. We're talking about the lower self, of course. Knowing we are making meaningful contributions to others' lives leads not only to improve work outcomes, but also to enhance health and well-being, scientifically proved. Even small acts of generosity trigger changes in our brains that makes us happier. Let's think about that. Work creates energy with measurable benefits for the giver, for the receiver, for the whole organization or community. Work can improve health and well-being. What are we doing for others? In the end, we are what we contributed to the world today. Tomorrow turns into the next day. But we always have our today. Every morning, when we wake up, we should remind ourselves, it's not about me. Every day, we should remind ourselves, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about all of us. Thank you. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Om, that outer world is Purna, full of divine consciousness. This inner world is also Purna, full of divine consciousness. From Purna comes Purna. From the fullness of divine consciousness, the world is manifested, taking Purna from Purna. Purna indeed remains, because divine consciousness is non-dual and infinite. Om, peace, peace be to all. Thank you, everybody, for joining us from home. Um, I hope 
you could uh, follow the message of today's talk. Unfortunately, we don't have Q&A. I really miss you all. And uh, looking forward to seeing you here at our venue, Ramakrishna Monastery. Thank you so much. Jai Ramakrishna.